By what logic or calculation can goods be said to be more important than life? By what logic or calculation can life on one side of a line be given more importance than life on the other side? How do you calculate which is worse? Destroying a family through deportation or incarceration or ending a life through the difficulty of crossing a border? These are my questions from the previous panel, which provide a useful starting place for my talk. I would argue that any system of logic, math, or science, or weights, or uh, calculations, or prices of goods that would provide the currently accepted answers to these questions should be abandoned, as it is clearly flawed. If we can allow deaths on the scale of 10,000 people, such as in the case of the Mexico-US border, then we must rethink logic itself. So I want to start today with some concepts behind the work that I have in the show and then talk a little bit about the actual piece that's in the show and if there's time, talk about some more recent work of mine. Oh, this charger is not charging. It's not charging. Okay, so I want to start with this idea of science of the oppressed. Science of the oppressed is this concept that comes from the particle group uh, with some of the members. Uh, I'm part of this artist's collective called the Electronic Disturbance Theater, and some of the members are in this other group called the Particle Group. And in 2009, they wrote this piece called Nano Geopolitica Poetica Pellicula, Fabricating with Minor Scales in which they talked about a concept of science that would question what is science and in whose interest. Uh, and so in this piece they say, we can imagine Augusta Boal's theater of the oppressed, Chela Sandoval's methodology of the oppressed, critical art ensembles, tactical science, Natalie Jeremijenko's public experiments, and what the electronics disturbance theater has framed today as science of the oppressed. So these are some other artistic and theoretical examples that kind of situate our work and this kind of thinking. Each part of a long history of an epistemology of social production which privileges the standpoint of the proletariat, the multitude, the open hacks of DIY moments, and of autonomous investigators who stage zones of cognitive styles out of concrete practice as speculation, and speculation as concrete practice at the speed of dreams. Science of the oppressed starts by rejecting the hierarchies of knowledge and privilege that, the hierarchies of knowledge that privilege academic knowledge or knowledge produced by professional artists, instead calling for a knowledge production based in experiences of oppression. Instead of making art in the service of, uh, or instead of making knowledge and science in the service of corporations, as we increasingly see happening in universities in the US and Canada, uh, we are proposing to develop knowledge in the service of oppressed people. And so in this science, the skills developed daily by people who experience oppression and forms of violence, racialized, sexualized, gendered forms of violence, such as borders, national borders, are crucial for thinking new solutions to existing social problems. So Augusto Boal developed theater of the oppressed as a way of using the body directly to break out of routine habits of thinking and find new ways of thinking and knowing by moving in new ways. Um, but I think in Sandoval's methodology of the oppressed, we have a particularly useful example um, where she writes about uh, Frederick Jameson's essay, Postmodernism. And she says, if, as Jameson argues, the formerly centered and legitimated bourgeois citizen subject of the first world is set adrift under the imperatives of late capitalist conditions, if such citizen subjects have become anchorless, disoriented, incapable of mapping their relative positions inside multinational capitalism, then the first world subject enters the kind of psychic terrain formerly inhabited by the historically decentered citizen subject, the colonized, the outsider, the queer, the subaltern, the marginalized. So too, not only are the psychopathologies, but also the survivors, survival skills theories, methods, and the utopian visions of the marginal made not just useful but imperative to all citizen subjects. So I think Sandoval's work in particular is useful in answering what those, those questions I was asking in the beginning about how can some life be more important than others? How can goods be more important than some kinds of life? Clearly that's based on a racist, white supremacist, heteropatriarchal, 
masculinist, colonial set of thinking, right? And hopefully we can agree that perhaps we should move on from that kind of thinking. Unfortunately, I don't think the previous speaker is here, sadly. Maybe, uh, uh, anyway, um, that's unfortunate. So, uh, let's see. Nee, let's move on. So the transporter immigrant tool, which is this thing that's shown here and you can also see in the exhibition, the transporter immigrant, immigrant tool was a project, is a project, of turning recycled cell phones into life-saving devices with GPS technology and poetic sustenance. So for this project, I worked with this collective called the Electronic Disturbance Theater, who's shown here, and we wrote this app for inexpensive Nextel cell phones that would allow people to access the GPS service in a phone without having cell phone service so that they could use the phone to navigate across the border without being tracked so easily. And uh, as the user is being kind of shown directions towards uh, life-saving sources of water, they're offered the possibility of hearing poetry. And so, uh, and to make this happen, we worked in concert with social movements, uh, working, doing humanitarian aid on the Mexico-U.S. border, and uh, who put water caches in the border regions, uh, like the Border Angels and Water Stations, Inc., and we used the GPS system to map out these water caches, and then we wrote this software that would direct users to water. Uh, so this is Brett Stahlbaum who wrote most of the code, this is Amy Sarah Keor who wrote most of the poetry, this is Ricardo Dominguez who is the Mayan technologist wizard, and this is uh, Ellie Merman, the sound artist, and that's me who mostly acted as a liaison between these social movements I had been a part of and the artists. So this is kind of a how the phone was envisioned as working, how the phone works. It provides this kind of compass interface. So when you turn on the phone, it would give you a list of nearby water sites, and you could choose one, and then it would direct you using a compass interface towards the water, and once you've arrived there, it would vibrate and say this agua icon or water icon. Um, so we're thinking with that tool, so with this, these images and with the tool, we're thinking about moving away from augmented reality as something that's usually entertainment for privileged first world subjects and towards something more like augmented geography as a life-saving tool. So this is um, safety devices as artwork. So uh, before poetic sustenance, so we were motivated by a few main design parameters. One, the phones needed to be cheap and affordable so we could buy a lot of them and distribute a lot of them in Mexico to people wanting to cross the border. The next one was that we had to encrypt the map data so that people could only access the map of the water caches through the application because the anti-immigrant racist vigilantes who operate in the US-Mexico border uh, like to find the water caches and destroy them and have also in some cases poisoned them, filled them with antifreeze so that people traveling at night would not see and would drink them. Yes, very bad. So, that was an important part, is protecting the data, and that's part of why we release the software as open source software online, but it's not a functioning version because it doesn't have the map because we don't want anyone to have access to it. Our plan, the software is still in beta testing and some final translation stages, and our, our hope is to distribute it in Mexico through workshops at humanitarian aid organizations that provide services for migrants, like in Tijuana, there's a place called Casa Migrante that we've been in conversations with. Um, lastly, we wanted the, phone, the device to be easy to use so that if you were in a low cognitive state that's caused by dehydration, dehydration is the number one cause of death in the US-Mexico border, that you could still use it. So that's why we use this vibration interface. We call it like a witching interface so that when you're like at the water, it would vibrate. So the phone includes some poetry, but also in the work around the phone, like a gallery shows in the publications, we have presented a number of poems kind of inspired by the work. So this is one of the poems Amy Sarah Carroll wrote. She's a concrete poet. It says, in the desert, we are all illegal aliens. And in our publication, Sustenance, that was published by Printed Matter, we distributed some of, the, um, some of these poems in there and also kind of theoretical reflections on, on the project, uh, what we thought was important about it. 
Also part of what we distributed in the sustenance publication was this letter from three right-wing US Congress people that was sent to the chancellor of our university saying that we were guilty of a felony of enticing immigrants to cross the border and urging an investigation into our project. So there were subsequently three investigations that followed, um, a federal one and a university one and a financial one, which certainly extended the bounds of the performance in really interesting ways, such as when the financial auditors asked me what my role was and I talked about um, you know, bringing, together trans bringing together transnational thinking with queer theory, the auditor was like, I've never heard of such a thing as queer theory. And I was like, well, there's a class on campus, you could audit it. Uh, I don't, and I told him he was doing a great job in his performance as an auditor, and I don't think he was found any of those things funny. Um, but part of the central thinking behind the project is to rethink this idea of performance art as someone on stage like me who's performing for you, and instead think about performance art as something that can be distributed. So not only are the artists who are making these tools and performing, doing performances about them, the artists, but also people who are crossing the border are part of the performance. The investigators who are questioning us are certainly in their role as uh, investigators. Um, so after these congressional letters and the investigations, the uh, right wing in the US certainly was very interested in us and there was a lot of media coverage, um, like hundreds and hundreds of stories, including Glenn Beck, this famous right wing commentator who said that our poetry can destroy the nation, um, which I think is the best review that I've ever had. And I should keep that on my resume for a long time. Um, but also we found that any time that there was coverage on these right wing US news stations like Fox, we would receive a deluge of hate mail and death threats. Numerous, very detailed death threats. Some of them came on paper, some of them came in email. Um, we also put those in our publications and in our performances. Um, yeah. Okay, so another part of what I've been thinking about in the Transborder Immigrant Tool is the intersections of transgender and transborder, part of perhaps what the last speaker was talking about. And um, one of the intersections I think about is an affective one or an emotional one. Uh, affect's not really emotion. I'm talking, saying that for the students. Affect is like emotion, something similar. Um, an affective one in the hope of transformation. So uh, I think that's something similar, that the trans and transborder and transgender can signify a crossing, but also a hope and a bravery in crossing. And that trans people experience the hope of crossing to a new place, the place of a new body. And uh, as a transsexual myself, there, I think that this is something trans people share with those who hope to find a better life by moving their bodies to a new place across an international border. Perhaps the hope of becoming a better parent or becoming a professional or becoming someone free of gender-based oppression. So hopefully my, yes. Okay, I will interrupt that. I think you got the point. This is another one of the poems that's part of the project. That was Ellie Merman, the sound artist. So I think another intersection here of transgender and transborder is thinking about transgender prisoners in immigration detention. Um, because when we think about what is our image of a border crosser, um, maybe you're our image today of a border crosser, but generally we have some image of a border crosser. And part of our goal in this project is to change that image. I think some people have said to us, oh, it's so insulting that you would think immigrants want to hear poetry. <laughs> which I find very curious. It says a lot, I think, about who people imagine are, are crossing the border. Um, but also the Border Patrol itself in, in, in interviews about our project has acknowledged that many people use GPS systems to cross the border. So why is it that we have this image of people crossing the border that they don't know how to use technology, 
or they don't, they don't appreciate poetry. So perhaps our part of our goal is to change that image, to imagine, why not imagine that everyone crossing the border has a GPS or a really nice camel pack? Who knows? Um, but thinking about trans prisoners, Victor Are Victoria Arellano was a 23-year-old transgender Mexican immigrant who died from complications of AIDS while in custody of the Department of Immigrations. And I think cases like this, there are numerous cases of them, should reveal how the border is not just a racialized, racist logic, but also a logic of around policing uh, genders. Um, also this logic, I mean, it's basically a colonial and a carceral logic, but fundamentally a binary logic, right? That says that like, we are here and other people are there outside the border and the people inside the border matter and the people outside don't. I think it's very similar as in thinking that there's men over here and there's women over there. And of course, that means men are in power and should be in control and women should be uh, not and less important. Whereas in fact, I would say those borders are not so clear. Okay, so thinking about other kinds of science of the oppressed that have been inspired, that I have been inspired by and done some other related projects. Um, one is thinking, I've thought a lot about femme disturbance. So I apologize in advance to the translators that uh, this is a complicated discussion in French <laughs> because this word femme in US and Canada uh, doesn't mean woman, it doesn't mean feminine, um, it, it often, when people talk about femmes as an identity, they're talking about queer femmes, they're talking about a kind of femininity that might perhaps exceed the normative boundaries of gender, between, of male and female gender. So that's the kind of femme that I'm talking about here. Um, but Lisa Dugan and Kathleen McHugh in 2003 in their essay, A Feminist Manifesto, uh, call for a femme science that's addressed to the future, a future for femininity as we know it, has been completely superseded. So this call really inspired me to think about the ways that queer femme affect has the ability in itself to disturb capitalist ethics and Western rationality. I have termed this idea of femme disturbance a combination of femme science and electronic disturbance, thinking about what is it that is so dangerous for corporate workplaces about lipstick and high heels and short skirts. Another kind of science of the oppressed I'm interested in and in developing through writings and projects is the transreal and transreal aesthetics. So building on the notion of trans and transgender, I've proposed that transreal aesthetics cross the boundaries of realities created by a fragmentation of reality that occurred as a result of postmodern theory and emerging technologies. So in my book, I talk about different ways that artists are working with multiple realities today, one of them being trans realities or explicit reality construction, the other being transreal identities or transreal performativity, and the third being transreal technologies or imagining new logics. Neplanta.open imagined world. Neplanta.shift towards imagined body. Upload my body and resist logics of capital. If rejecting binaries, male or female, citizen or migrant, then no need to check if we're running in the desert or the city, just set the danger flag and run. Danger equals high, running equals true. So that's part of a code poem that I wrote for this project based on the actual code from the Transborder Immigrant Tool. So I took the source code that was available online at walkingtools.net and modified it into this poem. So in my, almost, you didn't pass me the one yet, but very short on time. It's coming, it's coming. <laughs> um, some of the projects that I've done that I think about as transreal are Becoming Dragon, where I lived in Second Life for 365 hours with a motion capture system and a head-mounted display where all I could see was Second Life. And I wrote code so that my non-binary, non-male or female avatar of a dragon could move when I moved. And uh, this was to question the one-year requirement of uh, real life experience, it's called, that trans sexuals have to face before they can get surgery and to ask, could you live for a year in Second Life and then get your dragon change surgery? Um, just as a response to people's normative ideas about like my simple desire to be a woman, I was like, well, what if I want to be a dragon, huh? <laughs> um, other trans real things that I think are more explicitly trans real are this project I did called Virus Circus, a collaboration with Ellie Mertmand, where um, it's kind of a series of science fiction performances that were about the intersections of um, racist and racialized thinking and language with medical and medicalized thinking of language. 
Um, so I think that sometimes you will hear people like on the previous panel say that uh, immigration is a scourge. That is a racialized and medicalized uh, phrase. <laughs> and similarly, we can see lots of intersections, especially in the US context around uh, H1N1 and swine flu, what used to be called swine flu. Um, but we can think about the transborder immigrant tool as a kind of transreal gesture if we look at it as an augmented geography, like I said. So there's, we can already think of the border even as transreal, right? Because it's, it's fictional. It's this fiction that there's a line in the sand in which people should die over. But it's actually real because there's guns and guys with guns and fences and people die from it. Um, but with the tool, we're trying to over, so there's the, there's the real, the desert of the real, and then there's this layer of data, which is the navigational information that we're overlaying on top of it. So in my very generously given to me last minute, I would just say, um, so the last thing, what I've been doing more recently is after the transborder immigrant tool, been interested in kind of trying to address what I thought were some of the problems with the transborder immigrant tool. Um, one being I felt like we were making this tool for somebody who was some, somebody else, for some community we were not a part of. So I started thinking, how could I make safety devices for myself to feel safer walking home at night, because I often don't, um, and for the communities I'm a part of to feel safer. So I worked on this project called Local Autonomy Networks, which is a project to build um, clothes that have network wireless transmitters and GPSs embedded in them. So particularly for women and queer and trans people of color to wear so that if they need help, if they're in a moment of violence, they could just turn on their hoodie or their dress or their bracelet and all of their friends in their local safety network would be notified. So this is a prison abolitionist strategy. Uh, notice this strategy is not notifying the police because in many cases police cause more harm and violence to women and queer and trans people of color when they arrive, as was mentioned previously. Um, so instead I've been working on uh, building networks of people who agree to keep each other safe through performances and workshops in lots of different cities. Um, and sometimes those performances are, are more choreographed or, or sometimes they're just like a, f a few of us working on a choreographic parameter. Like in this case I did this performance in Berlin and Hamburg based on the simple choreography of this survival strategy of, that my friends had used many times of them standing in between me and some aggressor. So we built a kind of choreography around that of one performer standing in between the other performer and the audience. Um, and lastly, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm doing an upcoming series of kind of hackathon or open workshops to get more people to develop other kinds of safety technology. Um, to answer the question, why do we have better, better technology to share pictures of lunch than we do to keep each other safe? Um, and hopefully more people will want to do that. And the last poem is that the desert is an ecosystem of sus with a logic of sustainability of orientation unique unto itself. For example, if the barrel cactus, known otherwise as the compass cactus, stockpiles moisture, it also affords direction. As clear as an arrow or a constellation, it leans south. Orient yourself by this mainstay or by flowering desert plants that growing toward the sun face south in the northern hemisphere. That poem by Amy Sarah Carroll I think speaks well of how, um, you know, this land is older than these colonial borders and we can figure out ways around it. Merci.